Amen. 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 Let's give Jesus a hand clap of praise in this place. He is worthy. Let's give our praise team, let's give David and his crew a hand. Listen, we are all improvising this morning, but everybody's done so great. Give me my bag over there. Give me my bag. Amen. They've done a great job. Done a great job. You guys can be seated. Let me step aside for just a moment to give you all some room. We're cramped and we're a little bit cramped. You know what, though? I was sitting over here looking around. And I love our sanctuary. I think it's, it's, I was telling Sister, I think Sister Vicki earlier this week, I said, you know what, I, I, and I'm at different places throughout of our, 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 our conference, and there's some 185 churches, I think, in our conference. You know what, we have probably one of the top 10, at least a top 15 facility in the Appalachian Conference of the Pentecostal Holiness Church. Now, we're improving that. But, but you know what? Sometimes it's like you guys get lost in there. <laughs> and I'm looking, it's like, hey, who's back there on the back pew, you know? You know, maybe, maybe this will be a, a little incentive and initiative for us to become closer. Amen. Closer together and we can move towards the front and, and, uh, and gather together in a more intimate way. But listen. But regardless of where you choose to sit in the sanctuary, we're glad that you're here. Amen? And we're glad that you're here this morning. So, uh, this, I started to say snuggle, but that's not the good word to use. So, just, just be comfortable where you're at. If appropriate, snuggle up to the person you're sitting beside, okay? When it were appropriate. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn them to the Gospel of Luke. The Gospel of Luke, chapter number 10. Luke 10. Out of the four Gospels, I, I love the book of Luke. Luke, is prob Luke was written in the, uh, in the uh, fashion that is probably more appealing to us as Westerners. Uh, it's just... It's, I just love Dr. Luke's writing, but all, all of the gospel's good. None of it's bad. None of it's bad at all. Luke chapter 10. If you have your Bibles turned there, I'm going to start reading at verse 25. I've got several verses of Scripture to read to you from this morning. Luke chapter 10, verses, verse 25. Reading from the New International Wording. One occasion... An expert in the laws stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law? How do you read it? Verse 27, Jesus answering, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. <clears throat> you have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, well, who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed on the other side. So to a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him pass by on the other side, a Levite is a, is a uh, hierarchy of ministry, if you would. In verse 33, but a Samaritan. Everybody say Samaritan. Samaritan. Uh, I've got a friend of mine, uh, one of my pastor friends. Uh, he, he tells me all the time, he says, I'm a Melungeon. First time he told me what a Melungeon, I said, a what? He said, I'm a Melungeon. I said, what in the world is a Melungeon? I said, that sounds like something off of a Tarzan movie, you know. <laughs> But a melungeon is somebody that is made up of many different ethnic groups, okay? A S Samaritans are s sort of melungeons, if you would. 
But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came, and where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. And he went to him, and he bandaged his wounds, pouring in oil and wine. That's very significant to us. Then he put the man on his own donkey, took him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two silver coins, and he gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Jesus asked this question. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The expert in the law. All of y'all know an expert, right? I do. Now, she, she may hear this on the radio archive sometimes. It's my big sister. She's an expert on everything. <laughs> No, I'm just. I heard about. I heard about. Uh, I heard about Coach Morris. You know. Bless the Lord, all my soul, and all is within me. An expert in the law replied, "The one who had mercy on him." Jesus said to that man, that expert, "Go and do likewise." tells me there was a good possibility that expert hadn't been doing that until that point. Fathers, we come to you. We thank you for the power of your word. We thank you, Lord, that the word combined with the spirit becomes a, such a powerful for, force that it can cause men and women's hearts to be broken. Boys and girls' lives, Lord, to be convicted. And God, you can bring us unto salvation you bring us into that place of ministry and you can touch our hearts by the power of your word and spirit. So now, God, as I stand before you, Lord, I cast myself into your hands as a vessel to be used. And God, I ask that you anoint me, equip me, Lord God, to minister the word to this congregation this morning. And God, I ask that you open the ears and the understanding of the people of this congregation this morning that they may hear, accept, and receive and apply the word of God that will come forth today. And we ask these things in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Now, I tell you what, this thing rocks. I'm not too bad, I'm, I'm not, I'm not too bad on rocking and rolling. You know, I, I like a little rock and rolling every once in a while. Preston Mathena probably left this here. <laughs> <coughs> it wobbles. Now, uh, he, did, he didn't build it. So I wanna, we want to ask ourselves this morning, I want to ask, uh, ask you to ask yourself this question. Who is this lawyer? Who is this expert? Well, the Bible teaches us one way he was a Pharisee. He was a Pharisee. Now, the Pharisees were the, the, Pharisees were the, the experts of the experts. They were, the Pharisees were the Jews of the Jews. The Pharisees were the, the scholars. Even uh, right now, if you go into Jerusalem, when you go to the Western Wall, there are uh, tunnels that proceed and branch off from the area of the Western Walls. Mine will mess you up being in front of these speakers, probably. I'll move back. <laughs> There's tunnels that branch off from the Western Walls, and there are... Orthodox rabbis that occupy those tunnels, they're continually reading the, uh, the, the Old Testament scriptures. They're continually studying those scriptures. They're continually there ongoing in intercessory prayer, even though they're, they're practicing Judaism, okay? They're, they're still steeped in the Orthodox Jewish religion. They have not accepted Jesus Christ as Messiah, but they are given over to much study. That's all they do. They're constantly, and, and they're, they're constantly engaged in a rocking motion. That, that is, they're not necessarily Pharisees, but that will, can give you an idea of, of somewhat of whom the Pharisees are. 
The Pharisees typically were uh, known to be prosperous or wealthy men. The Pharisees were men that were very much recognized because in the understand in the Jewish culture, religion basically is the government. Okay? So, so these Pharisees are men that are uh, economically influential. They, they have great governmental influence. They have great religious influence. Okay? So, so the Pharisees are, are very, very, if you would, influential people. They are people that ha- are high impact people. They are people, though, that possess a religious, but not an experiential, if there is such a word as that, experience in God. They, 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 the Pharisees are people that memorized, if you would, the first five chapters of the Old Testament. But they could not apply the, what we now call New Testament scripture because they were still and are still looking for a Messiah. We find that these Pharisees had, were people that by modern, modern standards could be really good model church members. They, they, they had all the do's and don'ts down pat. Paul said at one place in scripture, he said, I was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He said, I, I know all the do's and don'ts. I understand all the, the, the ordinances and the articles of the law and, and I can carry them out to a large degree. So, so these Pharisees possess a, a, uh, a knowledge, a, a, if you would, a carnal type of knowledge, a, a, a knowledge that's achieved through study, and, and they could practice it religiously, but yet there's something that had not happened in their heart. Just because we learn something and we learn it in our intellect does not mean that we actually act upon it in our heart. There's a difference there. That is why a relationship with Jesus Christ is also important into our life. But let's discern this Pharisee, this lawyer's position just a little bit. If you will notice in the scriptures that we read from text, he never referred to Jesus as Lord. He referred to him as Rabbi, if you're reading the older English version, or rabbi, which simply means teacher, as we read from the New International. He refers to Jesus as rabbi or teacher. He does not refer to him as Lord. Now, let me identify something with you this morning. Lord to us many times has become a slang word. Now, you know, there's, there's certain words that, that, that we use and we call it using God's name in vain and it's used in the means of profanity and, and, and it shouldn't be, okay? Listen to the preacher, we shouldn't be cussing Christians. Amen? Amen? Amen. And, and, and we, we look at that as using profanity and, and we look at that as taking the Lord, the Lord's name in vain. But you know, a lot of times you and I, my, my mom's by word was Lordy mercy. <laughs> Everything was Lordy mercy. When she'd get frustrated, it was Lordy mercy. And sometimes when we get, sometimes we'll, we'll just get, and we'll say, oh Lord Jesus. You know? But the reality of it is there, is, there is a great sacred meaning to using that word Lord. Because the reality of it is that, lo- that word Lord, when something or someone is Lord over your life, that means that is the greatest influence and they are in control or, or you answer to them in your life. So whenever we call Jesus Lord, you know, whenever we, we, we used to sing that old praise chorus, He is Lord, He is Lord. You know, whenever we, whenever we say that He is Lord, whenever we say Jesus is my Lord, it means we are in, He is in control of our lives. Not one time as we see him begin to address Jesus did this Pharisee, this educated man, this expert on the law, not one time did he acknowledge Jesus as Lord. 
You see, it's easier for him to say teacher. It's easier for him to say rabbi because that is the frame of mind that he beheld Jesus in. You see, Jesus can be a lot of things to any of us in this place this morning. Uh, I, there, there are a lot of people that say, yes, I believe in God, but just believing in God doesn't necessarily mean that we have a relationship with him. You see, it's only when we come to that place that he has truly become Lord of our lives that we enter into that relationship. It, it's, it's that there are even, even the Bible says, and even the devil fears and trembles at the name. The devil believes there, are, there is a God. I can promise you that. But that does not mean that he has a right relationship with him because, of course, we know he doesn't have one at all. So, so we find ourselves that we must come to that place where we, we can, it's, it goes beyond just an intellectual thing, but it comes a matter of a heart where Jesus is Lord of our life. He is in control of my life. He is who I answer to in life. He is my God. He is my King. He is my Lord. He is my Savior. In 1 Corinthians, Paul said this in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. He said, therefore I tell you, no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God, says, Jesus be cursed, and no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now, you see, the, the only way that any of us in this room can be in right relationship with God is through and by the working of the Holy Spirit. Now, in a couple weeks, we'll be, we'll be celebrating the Easter season and Resurrection Sunday. And the next major Christian event to happen following Resurrection Sunday or Easter as we call it is the day of Pentecost. The day of Pentecost when the Holy Ghost was given unto the church. And up to that point, and I'm, I'm probably spoiling my Pentecost message, but man had been baptized in water, and the ordinance of water baptism is still very much in effect, and we practiced it here in Voice of Praise just a few weeks ago. But Jesus said, but I will baptize you in the Holy Ghost. I will baptize you in my spirit. You will be saturated in my spirit. And the, the New Testament church was born on the day of Pentecost. And as the New Testament church was born on the day of Pentecost, we find that man is then drawn by the moving of the Holy Spirit. Without the Holy Spirit, it's impossible for anybody to get saved. I want you to know that. Without the drawing of the Holy Spirit, you know, there, you know, sometimes we can twist things and turn things, but I heard somebody say one time, well, you just can't get saved whenever you want to. You just can't get saved whenever you want to. I don't agree with that. I believe you can get saved whenever you want to. But the only time that you want to is when the Holy Spirit is drawing you. If the Holy Spirit is not moving in our lives, then we're not going to have a desire for the things of God. We're not going to look to Him. We're not going to want Him. So, so what happened is this religious man, this Pharisee, this expert, this lawyer, he could recite the first five books of the Old Testament. He had a, a head knowledge and he had an intellect, if you would, of, of, of the plan of God, but he did not have a relationship with Jesus. He could not even acknowledge him as Lord because the Holy Spirit had not moved upon his life yet. So what happened when we read this, if you go back to verse 29, sarcastically, this Pharisee tried to equate himself with the person of Jesus Christ. Because he says, but he wanting to justify himself asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? He was what, he was what, you know, we all want to, to make ourselves right in the things we do. We all want to make, the, re, the reason you shot the neighbor's cat wasn't because the cat was in your trash. It's just because you didn't like the cat.
The reason you were speeding is because you were in a hurry to get somewhere. This wasn't because you like to drive fast. Yeah, we, we justify ourselves. We, we make reasons and, and we, we've all, we always can explain why we just did what we did. We do. We, all, we, we can do. This, this man, this Pharisee is, 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 is attempting to justify himself and when he justifies, in, in an attempt to justify himself, he's looking at Jesus and he's saying, well, who is my neighbor? He's putting himself, he, he's trying to put Jesus on the same level as he, as he is. And, and what happens is when we attempt to, to justify or satisfy ourselves we actually are, are setting boundaries of how, God, how big God can be in our life. Are you with me? Whenever we, whenever we begin to justify, well, I, I really, you know, I could, I could do more at the church, but you know what? I got this problem and I got that problem and I got this to face and I got that to face. And, and, and we begin to make all the reasons why we're not more, more involved in Voice of Praise Worship Center. But all the time we're just trying to justify ourselves of why we're not. It makes us feel better. We want to be able to lay down and sleep at night. We, we, want, we want to feel better. So, so we find that uh, we, we're constantly looking for that justification. So why do we seek out boundaries? We seek out boundaries to satisfy ourselves. You know? For most of us in this room... Nobody's agenda is more important than me on selves. Most of us, we're that way. We're, we're human, there's a carnal nature, and we tend to think about our likes, our dislikes, our priorities, all that. We tend to put those things first in our life. You know, that, that's what satisfies us. Our likes and our dislikes. Whether, you know, whether we like... And apparently there was no argument in this room because we got brown carpet, we got blue carpet, we got green carpet, we got gray carpet. Everybody made happy. But the reality of it is we're about our likes and our dislikes. We're about our personal preferences. And even sometimes we will try to use and blame that on God. But the, but the reality of it is, it, it's about who we are. We, we, ha, we can't help it. We have the tendency to be self-centered. We have the tendency to, uh, of, of separating comforts and discomforts. And you know, even this day, this day is a perfect example because we're a little bit uncomfortable today. We're off in another room. It's not the prettiest room in the building. It's not the biggest room in the building. But, and we're, we're out of our zone, we're out of, we're, out of our, uh, we're out of our norm, if you would. And we're a little bit, just a little bit, and I'm included, we're a little bit uncomfortable. But you know, sometimes when it comes to God, maybe, just maybe, we need to get a little uncomfortable. Sometimes we need to allow, and we need, maybe we even need to ask God, God put me in an uncomfortable position. God put me, man, I can remember my grandpa. My grandpa, my grandpa loved to watch wrestling. Remember when the wrestling used to, those of you used to come on from over here in Bluefield and Roanoke had wrestling on, you know, Saturday afternoons and Sunday afternoons on TV wrestling. And my, grand, my grandpa had a swivel, he had a swivel uh, rocker. It didn't recline, it's just a green, ugliest swivel rocker, green vinyl you ever saw in your life. But that was grandpa's chair, police scanner set over here, the remote control to the TV over here, and nobody messed with the re remote, the scanner, and, and, and Papa's green swivel rocker. But sometimes my dad would become incoherent after he eat all of my grand, because we ate at granny's every Sunday. And my dad would get incoherent, too much chicken and dumplings. And he would find himself going over there and sitting down in, in, in Papa's green swivel, uh, swivel rocker. And my, my daddy has always had a routine of going to sleep when he sits down. So he falls to sleep in Papa's green swivel rocker. And here comes Papa in to watch his wrestling. 
He said, I want to tell you, and you had to understand, my, my, my papa wasn't a Christian, and I'm not going to go into that, but he said, my gracious, he said, what kind of son-in-law do I have? He comes in here and eats all my food, and then he comes in and takes, takes my best chair and goes to sleep in, and I can't even sit down and watch my TV. He's, he, he used some worse terms than this, but he basically called him, he basically called him a Sunday afternoon vagrant. But you know what? We have our likes. We have our agenda. For my papa, it was about his green swivel rock, uh, rocker and wrestling on the TV sit, and sitting there listening to his police scanner all at the same time. That was his zone. That was his area. You and I have our areas. Sometime we need to say, God, take me outside of my zone. Take me outside of my comfort area. Brother Eric Pennington, I want him to come preach for us here sometime. He's a great friend, great minister. Brother Eric Pennington said he knew why they call these things over here on the, like on the wall. He knows why they call them pews. Because we have sat in the same place so long. That's why they're called pews. Some of y'all get that after a while. <laughs> But the truth of the matter is this. We need to be moved out of our comfort zone. We need to be moved into areas that may be even a little bit uncomfortable for us. We need somebody, somebody, and listen, it, it can all be done by the Holy Spirit, but sometimes people can even, can God, work, God works through people. What, what, a, what a marvel idea. God works through people. And sometimes it even takes people to push us out of our comfort zone. Sometimes it takes Sunday school teachers or pastors or praise teams or, or, or whoever else you can. Sometimes it takes people to push us out of our comfort zone. But this is the one thing that's for sure. There is no bounds for Christ's love. Because what happened is Jesus is pushing this Pharisee into an area that is out of his comfort zone. Because it's, you know, when, 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 the, when the priest and the Levite walk through and the guy's laying over here bleeding in the street where he's been robbed, he's been beat, he's dying, literally dying in the street. He's wounded. Everything he has has been robbed from him. The priest and the Levite, which are the Pentecostal holiness people and the Baptist people and the Methodist people, Church of God people, you know, that's your priest, that's your Levites. They are crossing on the other side of the street. It's like, hmm, we don't want anything to do with that. No, no, no. Oh, yeah, bless God. You know what? I'm just not going to get involved in that. That's, that. That boy's in a mess right there. I think, come on, honey, let's go to the other side of the street. We can cross back over at the next light. But then a Samaritan. The priests the priest and the Levites, they're the pure people. Bless God, you know, they're holiness. They're pure. And the priests and the Levites dodge. They intentionally skirt around this guy that is in need. But the Samaritan comes along. The Samaritan comes along and the Samaritan is, is, is going to minister to the need. You see, because the Samaritan is displaying a love that goes beyond religion. It goes beyond just an intellectual understanding. You see, because God's love goes beyond dirt, it goes beyond poverty, it goes beyond ethnic groups, it goes beyond addiction. Listen to me real careful. And I hope somebody, are we on the radio? I hope somebody's listening on the radio this morning because it goes beyond tattoos, it goes beyond body piercings, it goes beyond... Uh, uh, different colors of hair. It goes beyond no hair. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 God's love goes beyond all of those things. You know, we, we quantify and we want to we wanna set people in categories and, and, and we want to, we wa listen, Jesus said, I wish I'd have worn my hat. I don't know where my fishing hat. So Jesus said, I will make you fishers of men. Some of you in here fish. I know you've told me so. Some of you, I, you haven't told me, but I, you know, you may very well be somebody that loves to fish. I never have been fishing and caught one. We used to go to Santee Cooper and go down there catfishing, catch them big old catfish, heads on them about that wide, and they'd be about that long. <laughs> no, 
It would be that long. But I never caught a catfish. We never pulled a catfish onto one of those pontoon boats and that thing be, excuse me for being graphic, they never be gutted and cleaned when I pulled them on the boat. You see, but we always had a little Vietnamese lady that took care of doing that for us when we got back to the dock. You see, God didn't call us to go out and get them straightened up before we are called to reach them, to see them saved, and then He, the Holy Spirit, will take care of working on their lives as we disciple them. So, so God's love goes beyond the body piercings. It goes beyond, what do you call the loops? Somebody help me. Gauges. I saw one the other day on the internet. God put one in his lip. It looked, you know, not my thing. I want to tell you that. Not my thing. But yeah, but those are not, those are the things that we have to look beyond and to distribute the love of God into their lives. And when we do that, we have to forego my opinion, your opinion, my agenda, and your agenda. And look beyond what we like and what we don't like and look into what we actually are dealing with, and that's souls. I may have told you this story already, but I'll tell it, I'll tell you, I'll tell the story to you again. Dave, I don't pick up one of these mics. You can mute it. I don't need it on. Well, it's got an off switch on it, so I'm good. I've been involved in talent and camps and stuff like that for a lot of years. I remember a number of years ago at talent, back when we used to have regional talent competition, and then you progressed from there into the conference. I can remember going to talent. I was a pastor, and I can remember being there at talent and these boys getting up to do music and the guitars was wide open and, and this has been a, it's been a few years, not too Their hair was spiked like this, you know. And they had on, they had on uh, collars and the, the, the collars, it looked like the one sp uh, that, uh, was it Spike that was in the Tom and Jerry cartoons, you know, Spike's collars, you know, had those metal spikes sticking out of the collar. They had chains. Their pants was sagging. And I'll tell you, I, ha I, I have grace in that now because the older I get, the more mine sag. <laughs> but the truth of the matter is, the truth of the and I'm sitting here like this. Here I am, a pastor. And I'll tell you, I wasn't wearing a tie this morning. Sarah made me wear one. No, I'm just kidding. She didn't make me wear it. And I'm sitting here as a pastor, and, and, and my first wife was, was still alive at that time, and I looked over at her and I elbowed her. I said, I'll tell you right now. I mean, they had these black guitars and they had, they looked like coffins and, and everything else. And, and they, they, when they got singing, it, it, was, it was loud. I couldn't tell you hardly anything much they said other than every once in a while I heard Jesus. And they, the ones that wasn't playing the guitar, they was holding their mics like this. You know. <laughs> I elbowed my wife and I said, I'll tell you right now, it's a good thing I ain't there, Pastor. I'd have set them down. <laughs> and at that point in my ministry, I would have. But let me tell you what. Out of those young men that presented their song, Pants laced inside their boots. I mean, the whole nine yards, the chains, the sagging britches and everything. Out of those young men that presented that song a number of years ago, right now, I know fact of the matter, one of them is praise and worship leader at a large church in Georgia, and another one of them is a youth pastor in South Carolina. If I'd have took care of that, bless God, if it was in my church, I tell you, I'd have took care of that. 
I could have possibly hindered, if I'd have done so with, without wisdom at least, I could have hindered them from being what God had for them to be. You see, God looks at things. He, he looks through things. I'm, and, and, and I always tell you, I shared with the board, I think, the other night in our board meeting, this is what God spoke into my heart this week. There is a difference between tolerance and patience. I don't, you know, some to tolerance, tolerance is, is just tolerating something and, and they may be a little bit of a connection there. But if we can be patient and let God do his work in the lives of other people, it's amazing what will happen in their lives. Listen, so there's no bound, there's a, God looks beyond all of the stuff that we look at. I've got news for you. He loved you when you didn't look so good. Now, I know everybody in here is not as good looking as me and Johnny. You don't have the hair. But God loves you just like you look right now. He's wanting to do a work in your life. He's willing to do a work in your life. I just spit all over Nathan. I'm sorry, we're just close. But the fact of the matter is, the fact of the matter is this. God is looking at something inside of you that a lot of people don't even see. You may not even see it yourself. And he wants to mold you and to shape you into what he would have you to be. Let me say this. Romans chapter 5 and verse 8. Let's read this. Romans 5 and verse 8. God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now, if he loved you before you were saved, how, how you know, you can't make Jesus love you any more than he loves you. You see, we, we, we get messed up in that sometimes. We think, well, if I go to church more, Jesus will love me more. Now, you need to go to church. Don't misunderstand me. I, I, I think the fellowship is healthy for us. Well, if I give more, Jesus will love me more. No, I think you need to be obedient and giving, but it's not going to make Jesus. You can't make Jesus love you any more than he already does. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. But the reality of it is, well, so if while we were yet sinners, he loved us that much, not that he loves us anymore, but the reality of it is, somebody that loves me that much, I want to do everything that I can to please him. My wife loves me, I want to do everything I can to please her, although I don't always. Okay? When I start doing stuff to intentionally displease her, then I've got in trouble. You have too, with your spouse. But the truth of the matter is, that's how much God loves us. You see, he doesn't love our filth, he loves who we are. And even after we come to know him, he still doesn't love our filth, he loves us, but he will help us to grow and mature in him. And those things that, that, that have been unbecoming to us as believers, those things that are unprofitable to us, as believers, those things that will hinder our testimony as believers. You see, what was wrong with the Pharisees, I mean with the uh, Levites and the priests, is, is their, their, their attitude, their haughtiness, if you would, was hindering them. They need to put that aside. The Samaritan didn't deal with that. But yet the Samaritan, the Samaritans were considered the scum of the earth. The Samaritans were, were dirt bags. The Samaritans were, were the people that the Jews wouldn't associate with at all. At all. They, they had been cast over to Samaria. They were half-breeds. They were cross-breeds. Nobody wanted, the Jews didn't want, they were unclean people. But yet that person, that Samaritan had enough in love in his heart to go and address the man that was in need. It wasn't about his lineage. It wasn't about his ethnic. It wasn't about his background. He could have had spiked hair and body piercings and, 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 and all kind of problems. I don't know. But the truth of the matter is that Samaritan demonstrated love to his neighbor. So we find that the culture that wouldn't allow a lawyer to love The Samaritan, in turn, in his culture, found love. So, we have the classic struggle. 
carnality versus spirituality. That's the illustration of this whole story. Carnality versus spirituality. Religion versus an experience. We find that as we as believers come down to this point, our calling is simply this. Our calling is simply to be like Jesus. Our calling is simply to be like Jesus. You see this Pharisee, this Pharisee trying to justify himself begins to ask Jesus questions. When we begin to ask Jesus questions and whoever came up with the, the initials, the, uh, it's not really an acronym, I don't guess, but what would Jesus do a few years ago, they were pretty smart. I wish I'd have thought of it. I'd be, you know, we'd, we'd, we could be millionaires. What would Jesus do? How would Jesus act in this situation? How would Jesus address that person that's your neighbor? How would Jesus address that person that you work with that is plum aggravating? That person that don't look too good. That person that's got the weird hair, the tattoos, the body parasite, and snuff juice running out both sides of his mouth. How would Jesus deal with that person? Do we deal with that person the way Jesus deals with that person? Or do we, like the Pharisees, set ourselves above that? Let me tell you something. According to statistics, according to Barna, the most renowned statistician in, in America, probably the world, Barna, Barna Research says that five years after a person gets saved and becomes affiliated with a church, five years later, that their circle of friends becomes so narrow that it's just narrowed down to being the Christian community. How many sinner friends do you have? Now, I asked you earlier, I hope you have five that's either lost or un, they're not going to church. How many sinner friends do you have? How many sinner friends do you and I connect with over the course of a day or a week? And when I say sinner, I'm talking about people that have not made a profession of Jesus Christ as their Savior. You that fish... I got, I was cleaning out my garage yesterday. I got about six fit fishing poles there in the garage. Keaton says to me, Pa, well, when he says it, he says this. He says, Pa, Pa. He says it twice. I, you know, I don't know if that's something spiritual or not. He says, Pa, Pa. I say, what, what? <laughs> pa, Pa, when, when are we going fishing? I said, I don't know. Pa, Pa, what, what? What you got all them fishing poles for? I said, I don't know. If I never go fishing, what I need fishing poles for? If we are not rubbing shoulders with people that are unsaved, how are we ever going to get Jesus to them? Now, the church has its work. And we have a work to do here. Mind you, has a church. But let me tell you, we are in a... The, 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 how many of y'all realize the 70s are gone? Any of you? The 70s are now gone. You could throw your, the eight-track tape player. You can take it out of your dash or your car because you can't buy them anymore, okay? 70s are gone. People will not come to three or four weeks to revive. People, we, we, the turn of society, of Western society has changed. People are not coming and looking for us anymore. We have to go to them. Who is your neighbor? Who is your neighbor? What does your neighbor look like? How does your neighbor act? Maybe it all's not going to be comfortable for you. Maybe it's not all going to be normal. But listen to this. Peter said it this way, 1 Peter 1 and 6. He said, be holy because I am holy. Christ is what makes us holiness. Somebody that has everything that we don't like as believers in their life is not going to make me unholy. I went to the Harley shop yesterday. I'm chaplain of the, of, of the Harley, uh, the, it's called the Hog Chapter, okay? Harley Owners Group. I'm chaplain of the Hog Chapter. I went to the Hog Meeting yesterday. Any of y'all ever been to a Hog Meeting? And, uh, you go to the Hog Meeting, I mean, there's a little bit of everything at the Hog Meeting. But you know what? 
That is who I, I need to be rubbing shoulders with those people. Yes, I can come here and preach. I can come here and preach to Christians every Sunday in my life. But I need to be rubbing shoulders with somebody that don't know Jesus yet. And I hope that you see that need as well. I hope that you see that need as well. Because who is your neighbor? Who is your neighbor? You see, when we are made holy, this is what the holiness calls us to. Holiness calls us to extremity. Okay? Holiness will call us to extremity. When we, are, when we are holy through the relationship with Jesus Christ, we're first called into extreme love. Extreme love. Extreme love. That means you can, as I said earlier, you can love the most aggravating people that there is in the world when Jesus is in you. You can love the honoriest, grungiest person there is in the world when Jesus is in you. Over in Max Meadows, where I, my former pastor, and of course I've lived right almost right in that community for a number of years. The nickname of Max Meadows is actually Meth Meadows. Seriously. The nickname of the community is Meth Meadows. Very few people, very few people in the Max Meadows, right in the local community area, um, get out and work public jobs. There's a lot of, of trade appeals manufactured drugs I sat many times I've actually I don't have many more I've erased them I sat on the church parking lot and video drug deals going down on the church parking lot bales of what I would assume was pot be this this big exchanged right in front of the church there's a big old tree in Max, right in the center of the community, Max Meadows. Is, I don't even know what it is. It may be an elm tree. I, I don't really know what it is, but it's a great old big tree. They, the building used to be in front of a building. The building's tore down. The tree, it's just known as the tree. It's just known as the tree. But most people call it the drug tree. Over to drug tree. That's where everybody goes. Said it, it, at one a few years ago, it, it it looked like a public parking lot. There'd be so many. That's what they do. Go and sit there all day long. <clears throat> On my trips to the post office, it was in walking distance of the church. And I'm not saying this in meaning to brag. I'm just I'm just want to share. A testimony with you. On my trips to the post office, I'd walk, and my trip would take me right by the drug tree. They had benches out and lawn chairs. Big, it was, it was just a community thing. But I'd stop by the drug tree. And I'd visit and I would share and I would talk with those people several times a week. Somebody said, tell you what, Pastor, I'd be worried about that. What are you going to do if they come over and do a bust while you're there and you're right in the middle of it and you don't get arrested? I didn't worry too much about that. I know, you know, a lot of the, we actually work very close with the sheriff's department as a church. But I said all this to say this, it's nothing about me. But I became pastor to a lot of those people in that community. And I did a lot of their funerals. Some of their funerals, I could stand up over them and, and know in the last hours of their life or the last days that they made their heart 
They're called an election right with Jesus Christ. There was many others, just like the one I did of the boy 34 years old a couple of weeks ago. That he just stands in the hands of a just God. Did I catch every fish in the pond? No. But there was some that I was able to reach. You probably heard the story of the little boy that walked along the shore of the, as he was walking along the seashore. And during the night, during the night, the tide had swept thousands and thousands of starfish up on the sand of the sea. And the little boy was picking them up and he was throwing them back out into the ocean. And an old sailor, he walked by, he said, boy, what are you doing? He said, I'm saving starfish. He said, look, son, there's thousands of starfish out here. Do you really think that you're going to make a difference? The little boy reached down, picked up another starfish, threw it out in the sea. He said, it, it did to that one. Who is our neighbor? Who is our neighbor? What has God called us to be? Don't allow us. Don't allow us to let prejudices hinder us from going out and winning people that need a Savior. Let me tell you as pastor, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not never, I won't turn anybody away. Don't misunderstand me. And I'm not saying you're not welcome if you, maybe if you are at another church and you feel the need to leave. I would never turn anybody away. But we, but, but, just because, so, just because a bunch packs up from one church and comes to another church and we can say, woo, our church is growing. And we are, but we aren't. Because there's still those people that need to be saved. And when, they, and, and when we reach those people, they ain't going to know how to act. They don't know how to speak Christianese like we do. You know, we speak Christianese. Blessings upon you, my brother. I can tell you have a servant's heart. That don't, that don't mean nothing to the guy that's hanging out down here at Lynn's every day eating cheeseburgers and hot dogs or maybe at one of these strip joints or something. That don't mean to them, oh, bless you, brother. I can see that you've got the heart of, heart of worship there. Christianese to them. We, 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 if we're not careful as church people, we become a culture within ourselves. And we lose contact with those that are not of us. So my charge to you as we, as we go, go towards this Easter season and this Easter campaign, there's a difference between tolerance and patience. One of the fastest growing churches that we have in our conference. And I know, I know this, this, this raises our, our holiness hair. Pentecostal Holiness Church, one of the fastest growing churches in our conference. The pastor told me a couple years ago. He said, man, I went and got me two of them big old flower pots. And I filled them up with sand. for people to throw their cigarettes and spit their cud in when they got to the church. He said, because those are the people that need Jesus. And understand, I'm not saying we lower our standards of holiness and our doctrinal standards, but understand this, we, we, we are not called to clean them, we're just called to catch them. And then the Holy Ghost will do His work, the Spirit will go, y'all got awful quiet on me. I guess I've went too long. You've got awful quiet on me. But maybe we need to get uncomfortable. Maybe there needs to be some that don't look like us and act like us and don't smell like us. Maybe we need to be more like the Samaritan. Maybe we need to say, ah, we, don't wanna, we don't wanna push off the priest, priestliness and we're gonna push off all this 
attitude of being a Levi, and we're going to be like the Samaritan. We're going to go over and we're going to go over and find the drunk. We're going to find the drug addict. We're going to find the prostitute, and we're going to go over and we're going to pour pour oil and wine into the wounds, and we're going to see them healed. See, that's what we're called to do. That's what we're called to be as the church. Not just a simile sitting in a holy bubble somewhere. Reaching the lost. So as we leave today, even if I put you out, and, and I'm sure there's probably some that I have, I've pushed you outside of your comfort zone this morning just a little bit. But think about it. Think about it. What if somebody hadn't become uncomfortable and came to you? What if somebody hadn't been uncomfortable and came to me? I want you to bow your heads for just a moment. Who is your neighbor? Your neighbor, neighbor is every single person in the world. There's not a single person in this world that is not your neighbor. And you're called to reach them for the cause of Christ. With the heads bowed and eyes closed, and I won't embarrass you, I won't humiliate anybody in this place this morning, but maybe you're sitting here and you don't, you've had maybe an intellect, but you, you don't have you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. You've never encountered Jesus in that personal, intimate relationship. If you're here this morning and you need that and you want that without embarrassing you at all, would you just slip up your hand and say, Pastor, pray for me. Anybody in this room? Can I take it from that? Everybody's either saved or satisfied. With your head still bowed, I want to ask you one more thing. How many, many of you don't do this just to, to appease the pastor? Okay? But how many of you sincerely would lift up your hand and say, I'm ready to be pushed outside of my comfort zone? Who in this room would say that? Any others? There's a number of hands went up. A few hands went up. I'm ready to be pushed outside of my comfort zone. That's good. That's great. The number that raised our hands in this room this morning, if, if, if we will be willing to push outside our comfort zone. So it's been said, I heard a pastor once say, he said, if you'll give me 12 people, I can do anything. He said, Jesus proved that. And I'm not saying we don't need the rest of you. Don't take that in that light at all. But if those of you that slipped up your hands this morning, if we will be pushed outside of our comfort zone, it's remarkable what we can see happen in the kingdom of God. This is what I want you to do with me right now. I want you to stand to your feet. Since we're cramped for room up front, we're going to give you an opportunity for anybody on a special prayer, but instead of coming up front for the altar service, we're just going to, right where you're at, I want you just to join hands with the person beside of you or lay your hand over on their shoulder if you're behind them. And we're just going to believe that God is going to push us. I believe God's going to push us. I believe He's going to take us into some uncomfortable situations. You know, there's an old saying. I know you've heard it. No pain, no gain. Physical therapists use it all the time. They say if we don't hurt you, it's not going to help you. No pain, no gain. We need to be pushed. Voice of Praise Worship Center. We need to be pushed. We need to pu be pushed into areas that we've never been before. We need to be pushed. We need to push into Areas of ministry that we've never touched on before. There's, there's people that have been beaten and robbed and they're laying dying. Maybe we've been walking the other side of the street. It's time that we take on a Samaritan attitude. And go and begin to pour in oil and wine. So this morning as we're hand in hand together, I want us to ask God to push us. And you may be sitting here and saying, 
Yeah, but I really don't want to. I'm happy with where I'm at. Exactly. I want to challenge you. Pray. Ask God to push you. To push you. Push you. Push you and push us as a church into to new areas. So let's just pray for that together. Fathers, we come to you today. Lord, we just love you and we bless you and we praise you. And as I come to you today, Lord, we just, we look at the surroundings. Or we, we see, I see a world that is needing a savior. I see a world that is deceived. I see a world that is, that is, that is, that is given over to much religion. I see a church that is given over to much religion. So God, I'm asking you right now that as individuals, every one of us, from myself to the least in this room, God, I'm asking that you push us into something different. God, I'm asking that you push us into an area that is uncomfortable for us. God, I'm asking you that you'll push us to that place where we're even squirming in our seats because we're uncomfortable. God, such a move of your spirit that we become uncomfortable. God, push us into areas of ministry that, that we have shunned, maybe we haven't even thought about before. But God, we know there's people that are there that are dying. They're on their way to hell. There are even some this very day will be waiting the balance. And who is doing what to reach them? Who is our neighbor? Help us to realize, help us to understand that our neighbor is everybody that is around us. They may not look like us. They may not act like us. Their skin is colored different. Lord, they, they may uh, adorn themselves differently. But yet, God, they are our neighbor. God, push us. Push us. Push us into uncomfortable areas. Not just because we want to be feeling uncomfortable. Not because we want to just simply say that we're doing something different. But Lord, let us be pushed because of the kingdom of Christ. Let us be pushed because there are souls that are lost and dying. God, I pray that today, that this message has been challenging. God, I pray that today this message may have even caused some discomfort. God, I pray that today, Lord, that you're taking us into areas that are untapped and untouched by Christian ministry. God, help us in Jesus' name to reach, to reach into areas that are being ignored. By the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen.